in the world of networking, we have the concept of a topology, which basically means it's like how things are laid out. Like, what is the topology for your house? <laughs> where are the rooms? Where are the things? And in networks, we have topologies that we can apply to the underlay network. That's like the real network with the routers and the switches and the connections and the path that goes through the network. And we also have various topologies that we could use for the overlay network, like the GRE tunnels or the IPsec tunnels that we can place logically on top of that underlay network. So in this video, you and I get to take a closer look at topologies for both the underlay and the overlay. So let me take you back in time for a little bit of this. It'd be a lot of fun. And that is back when I first got into networking a long, long time ago, we used coaxial cable for the networking of computer devices. So we'd have a piece of coax on each end. We'd have a little terminator that would stop any signals from being bounced back onto the wire. And then we'd have little taps depending on the type of ethernet we were using and that would tap in for the computer. So there's computer A and there's computer B and there's computer C and so forth. And this was referred to as 10 base two. And the 10 refers to 10 megabits per second. The B is baseband, meaning there's only one signal, one frequency present at a time on this shared network segment. And the two represented fairly close, not exactly, but close to 200 meters, which referred to how long this network could be. And regarding what topology would we call this, <laughs> we call it old, <laughs> but the actual concept is called a bus. It's a shared bus. Everybody's connected to that same medium. And because they're all sharing this network, only one device, think of it like a, a one lane road. Only one device can speak at a time. And if two or three devices try to talk at the same exact moment, there's gonna be a collision. So in this bus topology, where everybody's sharing the same network, it's referred to as one collision domain which effectively means that only one device can talk at a time. This also can be referred as one broadcast domain because if one device speaks on the network and sends a broadcast packet into the network, everybody else on that network segment is going to see it. Now, one of the big challenges with this bus topology back in the day was that if there was a break anywhere in the cable <laughs> or somebody just, you know, opened the connection here, basically the entire network would go down if we had a single fault between any of these devices on this bus. So about a couple decades ago, they came up with a device called a hub. And a hub is simply a multi-port repeater. Effectively, we could take all of our devices and plug them into this hub. We have device A and B and C and D. This little hub is a layer one device. So any signals that are sent in on this port that device A is connected to, it would just be repeated and forwarded out all the other ports. So in this topology, this is a logical bus because they're still sharing logically. Uh, a same similar network across the board here. And with a layer one hub, only one device can talk at a time. So there's still one collision domain. And because they're all in the same network there, there's also one broadcast domain. But the benefit is these cables here used unshielded twisted pair versus coax cable, which is used in this 10 base two scenario. So here, this is called 10 base T as in twisted pair with this example using a hub. So, so far we have a physical bus. Here we have a logical bus, but if we look at the hub as the center point here, it's actually wired as a physical star, with the physical hub being the center of the star, and then the actual hosts that are connected with the unshielded twisted pair making up the rest of the star. So if somebody just said, what is this network topology? <laughs> You'd have to say, well, it's physically a star, but it's logically a bus. So you can see how it can get a little bit tricky so with this topology, we could say that this is a physical star, but it's still a logical bus using a hub at the center. Now, one of the big challenges with a hub back in the day was that only one device on this network could communicate at a time because we had one giant collision domain. So they came up with a new device, and that new device is a layer two switch. And it operates at layer two, and it learns and memorizes the layer two addresses for everybody that's connected to it. So once again, if we have four devices that are connected, and once again, with unshielded twisted pair, same cabling that we had with the hub. And here we have host A and host B and host C and host D. Now with the switch, because the switch is aware of the layer two addresses, if host A wants to communicate with host D, the traffic goes into the switch and the switch on its back plane just forwards it over to the port that's needed. So host B and host C don't have to see it. So effectively, every port on a switch, on a layer two switch, is its own collision domain. So if this is a four port switch, I'll put a four port switch. Effectively, we have four collision domains. If we have a 28 port switch, we have 28 collision domains. Every single port on its own is basically a dedicated highway 
from the device to get to the switch. And then once traffic gets there, it's the switch's responsibility to forward it appropriately. Now, in the case of an unmanaged switch, which is a layer two switch, but we haven't carved it out or done anything too special with it, we still, with this switch, we have four ports, we still have one broadcast domain. Now, what that means is that if this computer sends a broadcast packet or a broadcast frame into the switch, the switch says, oh my goodness, it's a broadcast, so everybody must need it. So it forwards it out to all the other ports connected to that switch. And it's this type of a layer two switch today that most devices, unless they're wireless, are gonna be connected in. So in an office space, we have a computer, it plugs into a wall jack, that wall jack leads off to a wiring closet. In that wiring closet, there is a patch panel that then leads to a switch. So effectively, all of our end devices these days that are wired are connecting into a layer two switch. So from a physical perspective regarding the topology, this switch, this layer two switch is physically wired as a star, but logically it's also operating as a bus. However, with the benefits of giving each device that it's connected to their own dedicated freeway, their own separate collision domain. So as I mentioned, a four port switch with four devices connected would be representing four individual collision domains, one for each port. All right, and one other topology I'd like to chat with you about right here regarding local area networking is the concept of a ring. So let's imagine we have those four hosts again, A, B, C, and D, but this time we're using some technology that connects them all in a ring fashion. So in this case, that'd be an example of a physical ring. And with the ring topology, we could have a little token that's being sent to device A that says, hey, do you want to talk? And A says, no, I'm good. And then that token goes to B. It's like a talking stick, <laughs> you know, giving each device a chance to communicate and then forward that traffic around the rings. So this would be an example of a physical ring topology and also a logical ring. However, uh, when I was first getting my teeth uh, cut with networking back in the 80s, we had something called token ring. And in token ring, we'd have a MAU, a multi-station access unit, I think it was. Think of it like a hub for token ring. And then you'd have, for example, four devices connected. So there's A, B, C, and D. And you might think, well, that's a physical star. And you would be right. So physically, it's wired as a star, just like a layer two switch or a hub. Physically, it looks like a star. However, logically, behind the scenes, what happens with token ring <laughs> is we have that little token that's sent to each of the devices. So host A, do you have anything to say? Nope. And then it goes to host B, do you have anything to say? And then C and D, and then it flips all the way over to A again. So with token ring, that's an example of a physical star, but it's an example also of a logical ring. So in the back plane of this multi-station access unit, it actually loops around when it gets to the end and then forwards it to the first device in the path once again. So the great news today regarding networks is that we aren't using token ring anymore. And most of the technology we're going to see in local area networks at our companies is going to be layer two switches connected to our end stations. And we'll have separate sets of videos regarding the interconnection of switches and trunking and all that good stuff. So it's this one right here on the local area networks that we're going to see most of the time if we're using wired technologies. So now that we've taken a look at some options regarding topologies for local area networks, let's take a look at some topologies we might see and work with with wide area networks. And when we see the term wide area networks or WAN, it just refers to you know sites that are not geographically close to each other. They're not in the same building. They're not in the same city, perhaps. Maybe they're geographically dispersed. Maybe one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast, one in another country, et cetera. So let's imagine that we have a headquarters site and we'll call that site number one. So it's got some computers and networks and then it has a router or some other device that's connecting to a cloud. And that cloud, and the reason we draw clouds a lot is because we don't have to identify explicitly what's in that cloud. It means like stuff. So we could have a service provider here or it could be the internet. And then let's imagine that we have site two and they've got a network with some hosts and servers connected. They've got a router or some other device that's connecting them. And when I say some other device, it could be a firewall that's doing routing services, but they've got some device that's connecting them to the service provider cloud. And again, that could be the internet or a private service provider, wide area network services. So the key with wide area networks is that site one and site two are not in the same building. They're, they're geographically separate and they need some WAN connectivity, wide area network connectivity to talk with each other. And let's also bring in another site. Let's go ahead and bring in site three. Site three has a network, some devices on that network, and they've got a router or a firewall that's connected providing wide area network connections. So at each of the sites, it's very likely that they're using star topologies with switches and ethernet connections going to their workstations. 
They could also be using wireless. We'll have some separate videos on wireless as well. And now the question comes in regarding how do we want to connect the sites together? Do we want to have site two connect to headquarters and site three connect to headquarters? And if we do, that'd be an example of hub and spoke with the headquarters site being the hub or the central connection. And then logically, we have site two being one spoke and site three being another spoke. Another question is, do we want to have site two and site three? Do we want to have them logically be able to connect to each other? Or do we want to have to go through the headquarters site? Because we may do this as well. We may say, you know what? We want to go ahead and logically connect site two to site three. And if we did that, that's where every site has a connection to every other site. That's referred to as a full mesh. Now, full meshes, uh, you know, with logical tunnels and connections between all sites is wonderful. But if you have like 30 or 40 or 50 sites, it may not be practical, especially if you're doing it manually to implement the logical topology, which is effectively an overlay on top of this cloud network, an overlay of the tunnels or the paths that you want between the sites. So a full mesh is when every site has a direct connection, whether it's physical or logical, to every other site. And as an example of how that can get pretty dicey, if we had, let's just say five sites, it'd be, uh, the connection would be like this, <laughs> and then like this, and then like this, and like that. And I think we have all the connections in place. And so you can see the more devices or more nodes you have, the more complex a full mesh is going to be. So we could also do a hybrid approach where perhaps we have some of these connections, but not others. Let me show you what I mean. So let's say we have, I'll take out the links there. And let's say this is HQ1 and HQ2 for fault tolerance. And then we have connections that go up to HQ1 and HQ2 from everybody for fault tolerance. And then we have some connections here between. So this would be an example of a partial mesh or a hybrid where we don't have full connections from every device to every other device, but we do have connections from some of the spokes up to the hubs. In fact, for fault tolerance, we may want to do this and that as well. So device one and two are connected to everybody and site three, four, and five are only connected up to the hubs. And one of the big reasons that I talked about the underlay and overlay in the previous video is the fact that when we're designing wide area networks and we're logically putting these tunnels in, we can logically configure anything we want with the overlay. As long as we have connectivity from the headquarters site to site two to site three, we can then logically with an overlay, apply the tunnels to provide the logical connectivity over the service provider or the wide area network or the internet, whatever we're using for the actual transmission of those packets. So as you can see, there's a lot of flexibility that we have on both the underlay network as far as the topology and the logical overlay that we place on top of that network. Now, not every single network has the same purpose or same function. So in the next video, I'd like to chat with you about various network types, their names and their purposes. I'll see you there in just a moment.